So thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. I'm really pleased to be talking here, particularly because I think a project like LEARN is exactly what we need at this point to try and get further in the agenda for open science and open data, because we really do need that very granular dialogue among all the different stakeholders which are involved in this, and I'm really hoping that this workshop and the ones to follow will be able to do this. Now, my role here is to think about challenges to making data travel and to making data open. And this is not in the spirit of just being kind of provoking and trying to shut down the dialogue on open science, quite the contrary. The idea here is to try and really reflect on what these challenges are and what we can do here in this room, possibly today in the course of this project and in all the wonderful initiatives that Jeffrey was outlining to overcome those challenges. So what I want to talk about a little bit is the potential for open data. First of all, I'm not going to spend too much time on this because um, speakers before me, Jeffrey and also Paul indirectly have already talked about this. And then I want to focus on a concept that I'm using together with my research group uh, to think about open data, which is the idea of data journeys. How is the data actually circulating around once they're created by researchers? Which effects, which implications? What are the challenges in those travels, if you wish? And I will focus on challenges of collection of data, reuse of data, openness, and what we're calling the, the increasing open data divide, which I think things that activities such as the platforms that Jeffrey was um, talking about will do immensely important work in overcoming, but are certainly present now. And then I want to conclude with a few key points that I think different stakeholders in this uh, arena could be taking into account. Now, um, Jeffrey has already talked about the fact that openness in science has a very long history as a key norm. And this is because public scrutiny, the idea of transparency, and the reproducibility of results have defined what science is to a large extent, how it works, and very importantly, what actually gets counted as a research output. Is it data? Is it a publication? Is it software? Is it code? All these kinds of questions. Equally long, if not longer, <laughs> to some extent, is the history of reasons why this actually doesn't work in practice right now. There is, of course, the idea that science is actually as developed as a trust system which is siloed, is highly specialized, is made by uh, specialist communities where scrutiny is assigned to small group of people, and of course, that has consequences for this discussion and for what it means for data to be open and intelligible and reusable on a wider scale. There are, of course, long paths from data generation to what gets counted as discovery. It's, a, in some cases, a very, very long process, very complex. And of course, this is the question which I want to really ask now, at which point of the research cycle, the research trajectory, is it appropriate to actually make results open, whatever they may be? And should we really ask that question forcefully? That certainly seems to be something that research themselves are very, very concerned with. Um, there are, of course, very strong incentives provided by commercialization and competition among researchers, institutions, funding bodies, governments involved in this. And of course, this generates intellectual property regimes around research results, which are very often confusing. I will talk about the fact that we did um, in-depth interviews of several researchers, particularly in the UK, making them think about what openness means for them. And one of the things that was very clear from those uh, interviews was that people are very confused about the expectations that different parts of their identity actually have for them. So the institutions require one thing, the ref exercise in the UK seems to actually require slightly conflicting things when it comes to making data open, but at the same time having strong relationship with proprietary um, exercises and commercial exercises, et cetera, et cetera. That creates a lot of confusion. Um, there are, of course, the practical difficulties involved in disseminating and reproducing data, but of course also the software, the code, the techniques, the materials that are used to research, vis-a-vis -vis simply the research articles. And the publication regime itself has become increasingly commercialized, which of course has posed additional barriers and additional issues when it comes to thinking about openness in science. Now, I think we don't really need to go through in detail what makes open data valuable now, hopefully, we are more or less on the same page here in thinking that there are huge opportunities in thinking about how open data may, may really improve um, pathways to and the quality of discoveries. Uh, of course, it means that we can actually take advantage of new technologies that are coming in. Jeffrey was discussing this. Um, it means expanding and building on ongoing collaborative efforts across disciplines, nations, and different types of expertises in science. Um, it means to really think through 
research evaluation exercises and how those should really improve debate um, around research and the transparency of research itself. It means thinking about valuing research components appropriately and valuing not just research papers or particular claims coming out of science, but also all the other components that go into actually producing knowledge. Of course, there's the issue of fighting fraud, the low quality and duplication of efforts, and, um, and very strong issues around the legitimacy of science, public trust in science, public engagement, understanding, and participation. So open data, I view as really a platform to debate very wide issues. What counts as science? You know, what are scientific infrastructures? How should they be organized? What counts as scientific governance? And how results should be credited and disseminated? In fact, I would think that we cannot really think about open data and the management of data without addressing those much broader issues. Now, uh, what we're really focusing on in the research I'm doing with my group in Exeter is the idea that Making data open, very practically, actually means making data mobile and making them useful across different research styles, across different contexts, different research situations, and actually facing different potential uses. And there are major challenges to realizing that potential. So what we are really focusing on in this research is the conditions under which the potential of data as evidence for scientific claims can be realized sustainably and in the long term. So to do this, as I said, we're researching this idea of data journeys, which really means investigating in detail the conceptual, the material, and the institutional labor which is involved in making data travel from sites of production to various sites of reuse. In particular, we're focusing on the use of digital data infrastructures. This is because they provide a wonderful window to really explore how data move around, what is needed to make data move better, and to integrate data across a very wide variety of sources and different perspectives. And so what we're really focusing on are situations um, of, in which people are, we're collaborating with a lot of uh, data develop, um, database developers and curation, curators, but also we're looking at situations in which those data actually get reused, picked up, like both in developed and in developing countries. So we have ongoing studies of data reuse situations in the UK, in the USA, actually in parts of um, in the rest of continental Europe too, in Kenya and in South Africa. The methods we are using is to really try and focus on the qualitative parts of those journeys. So of course you can do a lot with actually mining quantitatively here, and this is being done, and this is absolutely essential. At the same time, what's really important is actually also to get a view on what are the qualitative shifts that one needs to um, make to really make data travel. And this is what um, we're doing. So my background is in philosophy of science, and we're using a lot of work also from the history of science and the social studies of science to do this work. And the idea here is to really try and contextualize situations of data travel so we can understand why in certain disciplines historically people have developed a certain kind of research culture, a certain attitude to what it means to have a certain output disseminated, who they're sharing it with, and for which purposes. And we can then inject that into a reading of what's going on in this domain. So we're using archival research to do this. We do a lot of ethnographies and interviews, very in-depth interviews on, with researchers and curators on attitudes to openness, and curation practices, and, and, and re practices of reuse. And actually, we collaborate with a lot of different scientific groups in kind of helping them to improve their practices in this way, but generally trying to open a dialogue around what this may mean. Um, also, this kind of research leads to a lot of policy involvement, and right now, I think a couple of the things I'm involved in which are worth signaling to this group is um, I'm leading the Open Science Working Group for the Global Young Academy, which is uh, basically bringing together 200 scientists between 30 and 40, which are at the cutting edge of their different fields in each respective country. We have um, representatives in open every country, and we cover pretty much every discipline um, in research, including the social sciences and humanities. And we just now are putting together a report on um, a survey, constructed on a survey we made on what is actually, what are the conditions for researchers to access software, research software that is absolutely crucial to then analyze data and produce results across different countries. We focus particularly on Nigeria, Ghana, and Bangladesh because we wanted to try and understand what the conditions for that kind of access are in those countries, and the results are really uh, thought-provoking. I'll, I'll mention them in, in a little while. And I'm also right now chairing an ongoing open data consultation among uh, young academies in Europe, um, which we are hoping to then bring to the meeting on open science in Amsterdam, um, which Paul has already mentioned. And 
let me just um, think a little bit about what these um, data journeys are. So um, the realms we are really looking at are several different disciplines. I've been specializing for quite a while on looking at um, the integration and the reuse of data in model organism research in biology which basically forms really the bulk of research in experimental biology right now. The issue here is to try and bring together data that concern different aspects of you know, the same organism or what is stipulated to be the same organism. So the big issue there is really interdisciplinary collaboration among biologists, which is a notoriously highly fragmented, highly pluralistic community with lots of different research cultures around. And we're also working on plant science, where one of the big challenges now is bringing together environmental, phenotypic, and different types of omics data. Biomedicine, of course, when there's a challenge, we're bringing together <coughs> clinical data, crowdsourced data, and biological data or relevance. Oceanography, where we have a much broader um, emphasis on lots of different things coming in and having to be integrated. And then lots of other areas of science which we're looking at in less detail, but still kind of trying to do this um, really through case studies. And the parameters for comparison in this work are looking really at the subject matter. What are people really trying to study? Are these complex objects? Are they simplified models? What is the nature of the phenomenon you're looking at? And how does that impact the type of data that you want to create and how you want to treat them? Uh, the source of the data, of course, and this is also a question of discipline and field and research ethos around that. The production mode of the data, whether this actually tends to be centralized or very highly dispersed, whether it's highly automated or system specific. The types of data produced, um, how easy they are to disseminate and analyze, the size of the files, the complexity of the files, the relationship to the software used to analyze them, publication cultures, collaborative ethos, and of course, on a wide variety of geographical locations and types of fundings involved. And of course, one of the things we're really interested in is whether or not there are data infrastructures available um, in these realms to disseminate this data. And obviously, one of the things that for me underlies the whole um, idea of open science and open data is a strong concern with what are the ethical concerns here, what are, what is, what are the opportunities, but also the limit of top-down regulation in these kinds of areas. So a very simple case, just to give you an illustration of what we are dealing with here, what we're trying to reconstruct. So this is an apparently very simple case, and as you can see already to try and explain, it doesn't really look simple at all. So what you see here is the um, home page of a database that's been very, very important within plant science for at the very least 10 years, which is the Rabidopsis Information Resource. This is a database which is focusing on one particular, the most important model organism in plant science, which is Arabidopsis thaliana, and features lots of different data that people can go and access on that particular organism. Now, what that means is that you have all sorts of different types of, um, types of data files, which you see there at the top, including sequence data, but also complex imaging data and other types of data that get submitted or get um, kind of, um, uh, incorporated by data, cura by data curators here uh, into the database. And then, quite simply, the database allows people to browse through the resources and produce all sorts of different visualizations which then allow them to build on those results and, and push towards like actually suggesting new claims, making new discoveries, and taking new research directions. Now, to actually construct something like this, um, not only there's got to be a lot of work in terms of the structure of database, what kind of terminologies are we going to adopt, but this is done in collaboration with hundreds of database curators working on different resources, which have to work quite closely with people who work on this to be able to actually create something that functions. So one of the things that's actually essential to people who access database in terms of really reuse the results and make sense of them is to always have a sense of what materials and in fact which particular specimens of the plant the, the results uh, are applying to. So one of the things that the Arabidopsis Information Resource does very well is intersect with the stock centers, which are places where all the seeds of the plant are actually collected, which are relevant to this research. So that there is always a correspondence between the materials used in the research and um, the data that people actually are accessing, which allows people to have a much better way of understanding them and possibly reusing them. And this is the EBRC um, bit at the, at the bottom here. Another important um, um, thing to think about here is how you're actually classifying the data so that people will recognize them and be able to retrieve them, which is a huge question, particularly in biology, because we have so many different terminologies around, all of which are well justified. I mean, they're born out of um, 
perfectly valid research and people really wanted to understand their phenomena, but causes a big issue here because you may actually call the same phenomena with lots of different names or vice versa. So even what a pathogen is in a particular example such as this is highly controversial. And those controversies, of course, make it very, very difficult to taxonomize the data here in a way that will make sense to people that need to access them and reuse them. So there are lots of um, services like ontologies, bioontologies, in this case the plant ontology, which are trying to um, put some order in this. And again, this is something which is collaborating um, in creating this resource. Then you have things like the iPlant Collaborative, which is one of these big centralized efforts to try and create software that allows people to really circulate this data in the right way and analyze them and reanalyze them in the right way. Again, huge effort now sponsored by the NSF in the States, uh, which has a lot of collaborations going on here. And then, of course, there are issues around once even you have the particular software you need, how do you adapt that to the specific needs of the community that we're looking at here? And services like the um, Intermine service, which is partly based in Cambridge, are very busy in trying to make sure that that um, two-way street um, dialogue is really open. And of course, I mean, this is just part of the complexity. I mean, we have this particular resource then doesn't just feed um, people who are, if you want, the direct users of the data, so researchers that want to go to this resource and just consult it and run their screens and then go on and do their own research in biology. This feeds into countless, by now, other biological infrastructures, which in turn provide their own analytics to then feed to further researchers. So this is becoming a very, very, very complex landscape where lots and lots of people are involved in what we call the data journeys. And even just tracing them in a very qualitative way like we are doing, where we're really following this step by step becomes extremely complex. Now, I think there are a series of lessons we've um, learned by looking at data journeys in this uh, level of detail. And as I said, this is just one of the cases we're looking at. We're actually analyzing about 20 now in different um, areas. And I'm going to classify them in different ways. So I'm going to start with challenges of collection. Now, data sharing, we've heard, and I think he's agreed, to be really effective, needs to be extensive. It needs to be, to some extent, um, comprehensive. It needs to be global, because we're looking at collaborations which are more and more in networks, which really are extending around the globe. And it needs to be long-term. What does that mean? Well, first of all, it means that, um, that when you're thinking about the donation of data, so the fact that researchers actually contribute data to the databases, this needs to be habitual. This needs to become part of a culture of really um, dealing with open data. And of course, there's a huge clash, and we heard this before, um, between that requirement and current credit systems and research practices. Particularly because actually making data fit for purpose to enter all these different journeys which I've, I've been trying to just very, very briefly outline is labor intensive. A lot of care goes into trying to make sure that your data will be fit and formatted um, precisely and actually labeled precisely so they can actually start to circulate in this way. Of course, one of the things also we've been demonstrating, I think quite conclusively, is that in historical terms, whenever people have done this, it really boosted the research outputs by an incredible margin. That's actually one of the reasons why the Arabidopsis community, the community working on this little tiny plant, has become absolutely fundamental to the whole of plant science right now, because they had a very strong open science, in particular an open data ethos from the start. And that, rather than actually making them less competitive, it made them immensely competitive with regard to, and actually allowed them to really constitute a core of research, which also they really use very well in thinking with funders, in thinking with other types of support for their work, and this really has, 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 has led to incredible results. One of the other requirements is, of course, to have adequate standards and guidelines for data formatting. And this, of course, is hugely problematic and really a challenge, given the very large diversity of methods and terminologies which are used in pretty much every field. Um, you need very well-organized databases, and, you know, and, and Jeffrey has um, chaired the report to your society where they were talking about intelligent curation, the fact that without this, basically, we end up with data dumps, which are just repositories where people just put their data. There's absolutely no way to retrieve them in any way that's structured, and therefore, it's just as well, you might as well not have even made that effort. I mean, the, the data is actually practically closed. Um, you need to share related materials. So particularly in some disciplines, and certainly in biological and biomedical sciences, having access to the data without having access to at least very detailed information about the materials on which you took the data, if not the materials themselves, is very problematic. And this is really a challenge here because um, reliable stock centers and collections are actually rarely available. 
and they're very well coordinated with databases. So this is really a space to build on, which needs resourcing, particularly from universities. Uh, data types are, of course, highly diverse, and the danger at this point in time is that all the emphasis in data sharing is going on data which are very easy qualitative measures, numerical measures that can be very easily uh, digitalized and shared, but um, files such as, uh, data types such as imaging data, which in biology particularly, but also in biomedicine, also in neuroscience, are very important types of data, are really problematic in this space because these are very heavy, very difficult to automate their reading and their curation, and they present different kinds of problems, and this doesn't tend to be confronted up front at this point. And of course, there are problems in terms of uh, committing to actually sustain data infrastructures beyond the short term. The problem really is to find a, a, a business model to do this, and there's a lot of work right now, which Paul was mentioning, Jeffrey was mentioning, in thinking about how to do this, but this is by no means um, a, a closed discussion, and I think this group would have a lot of input in exactly this. And of course, also keeping in mind that data standards and classifications need to be constantly updated. So it's not enough to just put up a database and then make sure that this exists for a long time. You really need to put in the effort and the labor so that it keeps absorbing and changing knowledge given what's happening in the rest of the field to really be useful. Now, um, let's go to challenges for the data reuse, which is really the core of what we want to do in open data. Well, the, at least the qualitative uh, results of lots of research has been done on whether data are being reused or not are, are actually rather depressing. There seems to be very limited reuse of data. And why is this? Well, I think there's lots of different reasons. I'm going to touch on some of them. One of it is the fact that there still is a misalignment, to some extent, between IT solutions developed to manage data and the research questions, the research needs, the research situations in which scientists find themselves in. And this is a gap that in some communities is being uh, closed, and in others, not at all. And so there's, to, there's got to be a really extensive dialogue between universities, funders, and of course different types of researchers about what is the relationship between computer science, um, automated searches, data scientists, and field specialists in actually finding a balanced way of, of, um, of really thinking about effective reuse. And of course, there's lots of problems with the access to related software. One of the things we found in this survey that we launched on access to global um, to open um, to software uh, around the world is that actually the levels of access of researchers to appropriate, even quite basic, proprietary software for some of the main applications in their own field was incredibly limited. Which, of course, creates all sorts of problems when it comes to open data. I mean, if I'm sitting in Nigeria and I don't have absolutely any access to the kind of um, software which I need to start to analyze my data, or maybe I have a very old version of that software, I'm going to be much more reluctant to share my data because I'm going to think, well, actually, I need much more time to analyze them. I'm not entirely sure that people will be uh, happy with what I do, et cetera, et cetera. So these things need to be addressed. Um, there are substantive agreements over how do you manage data across disciplines? And even within disciplines, there's very vehement disagreements on this, and that's something that we're finding over and over again. Um, because of the diversity of the methods, the terminology, the standards involved in data production and interpretation. And of course, I think one of the things that's most interesting that comes out of the research, at least for me as a philosopher, is people really disagree on what counts as data in the first place. Like the kind of items that some people in a field see as their fundamental core data are actually regarded by other people as utterly unreliable data which you should not even really be looking at. And one of the cases for me that was really surprising was the case of microarray data in biology which are in many ways regarded as a standard for a wonderfully standardized, perfectly curated type of data. But in fact, a lot of people in basic biology are still very, very skeptical that those data can be in any way replicated and certainly relied upon across different labs. So how do you deal with that? Um, now, reuse seems to be, and that's something that we also observed, um, often linked to direct participation in actually developing data infrastructures. What we found is that the researchers which are most engaged in reusing data, which are stored in databases, which are widely circulated, are actually the ones who have had at least a little bit of involvement, a little bit of understanding of how data infrastructures actually work. 
people who only access them as users without ever having engaged with the infrastructures themselves, with some of their curators, are actually much less likely to really um, work on them, and in fact, to contribute to open data efforts in the first place. So again, what does that mean um, in terms of encouraging open data management in universities? And I think there is a fundamental problem, uh, which we see over and over again, and certainly when it, when it comes to some of the policies relating to open data, which is a strong conflation between, if you want, the epistemic value of data, their value for further research, for advancing our knowledge, and the economic value of data. So there's a sense in which um, many governments seem to, of course, want to capitalize on past investments on data creation. Certainly the Human Genome Project is a very, very good case in point. But that um, actually can be a problem. That can actually generate some conservatism in how we think about which data to store, what to prioritize, what to prioritize in terms of you know, what we learn to manage first, if you wish. So the problem here is to be very careful about avoiding the idea of building on old data just because they were costly to produce in the first place 10 years ago, but actually like, building on data because we want to pursue new questions. In a sense, it depends on which data are available. So now, in terms of challenges of openness per se, uh, one of the things that we found, and that has already been mentioned, that I thought was very interesting, is the fact that there was a lot of semantic ambiguity among uh, our respondents and our informants about what they really mean by openness. So that seems to be meaning very different things to different people, even within the same discipline. And in fact, we've done a study looking only at system biology practitioners um, thinking about openness. We found absolutely, I don't think any one respondent had more or less the same understanding of openness. They were all pretty different. So people think about it sometimes as just being free of something, so free of a license, free of ownership, whatever that may mean. People actually, uh, some other people associated with actually being under a license. So something is open if it is under a CC BY license, for instance. Um, some people are conceptualizing open as a common good, like something you can actually all share and you should all share. Um, other people were really insisting on the quality of the results. So they were thinking, actually, open data is not necessarily all the data I have, is the data that I think are good enough to share. They're good outputs enough that I feel confident I can give, give them to other people and they will actually find them useful. Um, other people thought that it was unrestricted access or unrestricted use, no matter the quality. Other people really thought about this in terms of payment, so things that I can access without paying and things I can access um, through payment. And other people, again, which was very interesting, thought about openness as data which are actually unclear. They're open to interpretation. You know, it's a completely different way of thinking about open science. So I think here, an explicit debate between those positions and really to make those positions emerge is really important to even try and uh, foster this kind of dialogue. Uh, of course, there's problematic implementation problems, um, the ethos of certain fields, career structures and incentives lag strongly behind. This is something where universities can really have a key role to play. There are strong disincentives, particularly in very competitive fields, which are really set up not to share data. And of course, there's issues about publication pressure. I already talked about the fact that there, are, there is a strong confusion about um, which models of intellectual property apply and to whom particularly for people who are based in public universities but having strong collaborations with um, commercial partners which are supposed to be assessed by the RF but they have international partners so they're also indirectly subject to metric of assessment in other countries. I mean, how all of this plays out with respect to open science is very, very confusing to people. There are, of course, social and ethical concerns here and data both in terms of actually being, in some cases, actually the property of individuals, like biomedical data. This is data that you know, supposedly is actually your data, it applies to you personally. But also people who actually invest years in creating data, and so really regard them as having, a, as basically, a personal property of some sort. And um, there is a confusion around um, open data policies and what is the relation between open data policies and metrics of excellence and impact, particularly in the UK, people really thought that the metrics of excellence and metrics of impact within the REF were potentially in tension when thinking about open data. Because the question was, okay, if I want to have and document impact, I may actually be encouraged to enter into collaborations where data become proprietary, but at the same time, there is this strong requirement that I should keep my data open. How do I deal with this? Now, very quickly on the open data divide. Um, so one of the things we've been trying to investigate more and more um, is what we're calling the high resource bias. So I already talked about the fact that richer labs struggle to comply with some of the open data requirements and even to interpret them. But then there is a problem with poorer labs, which are left even more behind and in many cases choose not to participate at all in this. 
One of the issues here is that databases that we've been focusing on typically mostly display outputs of top English-speaking labs, which is not surprising because these are the places which have the funds to curate the context, have the ability to determine the dissemination formats and procedures to be used, have the resources, and in fact, have the confidence to build on data donated by others. The idea here is that if you're based in Harvard, you're actually going to have, in a sense, and I know this is probably sounding very unscientific, but you're going to have a higher confidence in the fact that you're leading the field, that you're allowed to be very open about what you're doing, that people who are in much less visible labs, whose reputation is not quite as high, and therefore are much more uncertain about disclosing exactly how they're getting to uh, the results. Now, um, the involvement of poor and, in fact, unfashionable labs, labs where people are working on problems which are not in the top priority of the grand challenges of the particular funders, um, tend to actually participate less in these communities. And this is also true of scientists in middle to low-income countries and, of course, non-scientists. This, this involvement still, be, still is relatively very low and very much at the receiving end. These people don't participate in thinking about how does one actually disseminate data in the first place. There are very few provisions, and again, that's something that I think this group would really be very useful in thinking about, uh, for situations when there is a systematic disadvantage. There are less infrastructures. There, there are very big problems with online access, um, and in fact, even um, broadband access. Um, there are problems with funding, with governmental support, different understanding of expertise, access to materials. <laughs> there are very strong teaching demands, which, which uh, vary um, very much depending on which um, uh, culture, research culture you're part of. There are situations such as power cuts and transport delays, which really affect uh, reality in, in, in some of the countries we're looking at. Also, there are issues with situations of vulnerability. And what we mean by this is situations where people have access to materials that, in a sense, give them an edge over other researchers. So they can extract data from materials which are very rare, such as particular um, um, fossil finds or particular types of plants, which really raise a big question around what does it mean, particularly for countries which are very, very um, systematically disadvantaged, what does it mean for those countries to make those data open? in a situation where having access to the material is actually what gives them the competitive edge and allows them to collaborate internationally with people. What's going to go on in, in that space? And I think, generally speaking, what we find is low resource researchers are reluctant to contribute because they fear, they fear that it will actually undermine rather than increase their international credibility. And again, this is very, very questionable, of course, but that's the perception we are finding. And so like, structures and dialogue needs to be in place to really try and counter this. Just to get to some conclusions, and I hope we can have uh, some discussion. Well, clearly, open data is not quick and is not cheap. It's incredibly important. I hope we gave you the idea in this morning panel that this is really as opportunity to change science considerably and for the better. But at the same time, this is not something that can happen simply by having a data policy in place and then you know, try and put up a quick infrastructure that can deal with it. This is actually a through and through commitment that all the stakeholders in this process need to have to really make this happen. It's very important to always ask on a case-by-case -case basis, I think, open to what and when. And I think the answer to this particular question will vary depending on which research area you're looking at and also which particular projects you're looking at. So to have a dialogue within each project around this question is absolutely fundamental. Of course, I want to remark on the very strong link between open data and access to software, and that's um, something that I try to um, push, and I, I'm more than happy to talk a little bit more about this if you want. Um, I think there is an issue and a constant tension in these discussions, particularly when there are discussions between you know, high-level policy bodies, such as the EU, different national governments, universities with sort of in-between funding bodies which are in-between, and then individual researchers, data scientists, librarians which are involved in this. And that's the fact that on one end, one of the arguments to try and motivate this is actually to try and estimate the prospective value of the data. And this is really also in economic terms, in social terms, in political terms. Right? And the idea here is, well, I mean, we can actually project the fact that if we make data open, then we may have X, Y, Z returns. Now, of course, we need those sorts of arguments in place. At the same time, there is a fundamental issue about open data in general, which is that what we're really trying to do here is to preserve the open-endedness of data interpretation. I mean, I think fundamentally that's what open science is all about, and particularly that's what open data is all about. The whole point here is trying to circulate those data, open it to others, is that others can come in and see them in a different light from you and maybe obtain different results or combine it with different data sources and actually start a whole new research program. 
So I think it's you know, this, the typical philosophical addiction, uh, sorry, in my field is always to look at the Oxford dic um, English Dictionary for some of these things, at least for some indications, in other dictionaries, of course, not just in English. And one of the things that um, it becomes clear is among the very many meanings of openness, there is the idea that is free and free of, there's the idea that openness means accessible, exposed, unrestricted. There's the idea that it means available, reusable on a large scale. And there is the idea that it means flexible, unpredictable, uncertain, unsettled, all of these kinds of things. And I think what's interesting for me is that policy discourse, and quite often also scientific discourse at the level of universities, tends to focus on the first three of these. It tends to focus on the fact that we have to think about how to make data free of X, Y, Z restrictions, and make them accessible, of course, and how to make it reusable. And of course, as I stressed in my talk, these are all very, very, very important concerns. But the idea of also always emphasizing the fact that ultimately we are doing all of this to maintain that flexibility, that unpredictability, which is so fundamental to science as a scientific endeavor, and to the prospective value of this, and that there is a limit to how much you can really um, estimate that prospective value, that is also very important to keep in mind. And in fact, also in policy discussion is important to keep in mind. Now, just very quickly a step forwards, um, I think, as I said, this is really a, like overarching exercise. There are responsibilities for every stakeholder here, and I think the roadmap did a wonderful job in outlining this and really starting a dialogue on what the different accountabilities and responsibilities are here. Just the points I want to raise in the end are, first of all, that current data collections are very limited in scope, and they are difficult to reuse by outsider, outsiders. There are wonderful um, um, engagement opportunities out there and wonderful projects which are trying to change this and Elixir, which Jeffrey has already talked about, is one of them where people are really starting to think critically about how does one change this, how does one think much more globally and internationally uh, about how does one construct this, but the fact is we are still very much at the starting point of, 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 um, of this curve. And I think very careful consideration needs to be given to what is disseminated why it is disseminated, how, and with which priority and timeline. So what I mean here is I don't disagree with the idea that actually as a bottom line, all data should be open. What I'm very aware of, however, is that this is actually not really the case. And in fact, there are choices being made at all points in this process about which data actually get released first. Who gives priority to what? You know, in which fields are we going to invest more money so that we make sure that they have the proper infrastructures to then make data reusable? Now, making those choices is really important, and I think it's very important that these are choices, not just something that comes out serendipitously of the fact that there happens to be some money here and there happens to be some interesting people there, etc. I mean, it's just important to see this because in many cases what we're seeing is that the areas in which these things are working best, I mean, actually, I mean, it, 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 it's an historical um, result of lots of different components, but at no point there's been any concerted effort to really think through, okay, now we are a community of biologists dealing with lots of different data. I mean, are we really gonna invest most of our resources in thinking about how to exchange sequencing data? I mean, should we want to maybe start to prioritize other types of data? I mean, having that dialogue is really, really important. Elixir is certainly facilitating this, but I think it's important in every field. Um, there's a very strong need to promote, I think, data curation as something which really is part of research. It's not an add-on, it's not just a service, but in fact, it's really part of what people are doing in creating discoveries. And this is important because in most of the cases we're looking at, people who are in, in, in involved in data curation and uh, data mining and databases are actually experts in the field. That's where it works the best because they really do understand data they're looking at, they do understand their prospective uses, and they're putting that knowledge at work when creating those very, very complex infrastructures that I showed you very briefly. And I think it's very, very important to keep cultivating a critical discussion about what counts as data, what counts as openness in each research community, in each center, in each project. And this really needs to take account of very specific ethical, legal, and political concerns that will be different from different areas. And I think universities have an absolutely fundamental role to play here, to really open those avenues, make it possible for people to come together and actually start to interrogate these issues. Our experience has been, whenever we engage with researchers on these materials, at the beginning of that conversation, they hadn't really thought about it much. By the end of that conversation, they were thinking, actually, this is really fascinating. I want to talk about it with my colleagues. So I think the will is there is actually having the opportunity and the venues that is lacking still. And I think that's really where there's a crucial role also for learned societies and funders in trying and, and inform people about this. 
And just the last thing I want to stress quickly is, and I guess you will see why I'm saying this um, given what I've said before, is being a bit careful sometimes with mm. talking about data openness as data sharing. That's the ideal. We would like to think that we're actually sharing data and there is a very strong set of associations with the term. I mean that we have some reciprocity. We give you data, somebody else will give us data. It's gonna be you know, it's sharing in that sense. We'll contribute to the common good. But actually, like, it suggests all of this, but it doesn't really entail it. And in fact, right now, what we're seeing is a situation where there's actually few data donors in each community which are doing the bulk of the work of trying to put out some data, and the rest of the people are really not reciprocated in any obvious way. And that issue becomes even more broad when one thinks internationally and, and, and between countries of different levels of infrastructure. So that's something that really, I think, should be thought about. We'll leave it there. Thank you very much. So thanks. The question is uh, concerning the data divide and the challenges. You've written uh, or shown that uh, one of the questions is data should be op open to what and to when. So I would like to add that to whom. To whom should they be opened? Because one of the big challenges we have is uh, the contextu contextualization of data. Uh, in which language, for example, should we op be open? Um, and. Um, I would like to talk also about the contextualization of tools, not only of data. No, I think contextualization is really important. But so the issue here is that there needs to be a, a good balance, I think, between um, centralizing global initiatives, which are absolutely essential in terms of thinking about standards, thinking about common terminologies to deal with these kinds of infrastructures, but also local engagement, and really at all level of, of, if you want, granularity here. So I think there are dangers both in doing what is happening actually in a lot of biology right now, which is almost every project in biology is very happy to put together data management plans as now stipulated by some of the research funders, create those data management plans, they create a little database for their own project, they may even make it open, but there's no engagement with actually trying to connect with existing infrastructures, with existing standards, and of course that means that those data eventually actually die and they're not connected to, um, to the broader web of what's, what's actually happening. At the same time, there are problems with having centralized top-down initiatives which decide if you want too much about what terminology should be used, you know, what framework should be used, which structure should be used, without consulting appropriately with researchers. And we've seen lots of failures of this. I mean, one of the very notable cases is this thing which was called C uh, CA Big, which was a giant cancer database in the States, which took many, many years to develop. Millions of dollars went into this. Lots of very intelligent, wonderful people were involved in creating this. But there was a serious issue with engaging the user communities there. And basically, that meant that the whole, almost the whole thing had to be chucked after 10 years of engagement because, I mean, of course, not, not completely, I'm exaggerating, but it was really a big problem. In, in, and there's been lots and lots of these kinds of projects around. So I think, again, universities are so important in trying to breach that balance and, and in bringing, and things like Elixir and different platforms, in bringing local realities and concerns in touch with these very needed international efforts to standardize and contextualize in a way that can be understandable across boundaries. Just to say that the word open is critical here. It's badly misused. In academia, it's been open washed uh, to mean anything you like, just as healthy has and so on. And particularly the publishers have uh, owned it and they use it to mean whatever they want. There is a large community in the world, I'm uh, with the Open Knowledge Foundation, who works very hard in, across the globe, not just you know Northern uh, Hemisphere, uh, for open as a means of uh, making knowledge open, useful, and reused, and an element of democracy and liberation. So I think it is important to stress what we mean by open. I, I absolutely agree, and I, I absolutely love the way in which the Open Knowledge Foundation is addressing this. I mean, I, I've been collaborating also with them, and I think they're wonderful. Um, but one of the issues that I wanted to highlight here is the fact that that 
itself is a huge challenge, which is why their work is so important. Because there are so many different ways in which people interpret the idea of open. And of course, I haven't even touched on the different language issue, which you know, I'm myself very aware of. I mean, I'm not a native speaker of English. Uh, by birth, and I certainly we, we do a lot of people. We do a lot of people that um, actually don't discuss these kinds of issues in English, and that creates even more misunderstandings. Hi there. It was a very interesting presentation. I'm Lucy Burgess from the University of Oxford. And uh, we've heard a few times this morning about systems of um, credit and reward for, for researchers in data management and, and reuse and sharing of data. And I wondered in your study of um, data-centric biology whether you came across anything that was working, because there seemed to be consensus that you know, we're not doing too well in things like the REF. So I wondered if you had any thoughts on that. Yeah. No, I think, well, <laughs> It's hard to condense recommendations for the ref right now, but I guess, first of all, there is really a conflict, like I think potentially, at least in the perception of the categories for excellence and the categories for impact, which really needs to be addressed, because it's not clear at all to researchers what's going on in there, and I think with good reason, actually, that it really is pulling in different directions when it comes to open science. And <laughs> my impression is that the species in which this is working the best are basically two characteristics. One is that the institutions, the actual universities, even more than the funding bodies, have a space to recognize, reward, and sometimes even champion people who are engaged in data curation and open data. This is very important. Actually, really giving people the recognition and really treating them as local champions can do incredible amounts of good. And so that is something that we strongly recommend as, as something which is a university measure. And the other thing is clearly, um, caring for data, which is, which is really what we're talking about here, is basically means uh, having people who are able to devote a little, little bit of, of their time to actually doing this, to making sure that the postdoc are doing the right thing, to actually training their students to do this, and that requires time. And so I think um, one way in which I'm understanding some of the results actually, for instance, that Paul was uh, putting up, that people that are reluctant to think about metrics, um, to think about open science and open data, is that the, the concern here is that we are having a research situation, certainly in the UK, which is completely overburdened with administrative demands and constant need to report what you're doing at every single step of the way, which actually leaves very, very little space for dealing with this. So I would recommend maybe shifting the balance a little bit and giving people the space to do this. I think the will is there.